Good morning, everyone. It's April 29th, 2020, and I'm back to share you share with you another video log. Um, maybe you wonder how I do these video logs. You might think I do one take and then I'm done. Uh, it is rumored that Abraham Kuyper, the great Dutch reformer, never had to edit anything, right? He would just start writing, and by the time he was done, it was done. Um, I'm not that way. And those video logs certainly aren't that way. So I started this morning with one take, and I started to watch myself on this uh, on my uh, monitor. And what I discovered was I didn't comb my hair this morning, so I had to stop for a little bit, comb my hair, and now I'm on my second take. So maybe that gives you a little bit of levity about your own life. You know, when we're spending so much time at home, um, maybe shaving and combing your hair and some of those things become relatively less important. So if that doesn't interest you and you find that just a little strange, you can just ignore that part of my video log and uh, think about the more serious things. So I want to pray with you, and then I want to spend a little time talking about um, a book on Christian psychology by Eric Johnson. And then, of course, I promised last week I would tell you more about Herman the Worm, and I am definitely going to do that this morning. Um, let me preface all that by saying I was hoping this morning to take you all on a little tour of the garden beds that I've created. Um, there were some uh, six by six posts on our property when we moved here. So I've moved those into kind of a sunny spot on our yard and uh, filled it with dirt. Thank you, Ryan Roth, for giving us some dirt. Um, and I was hoping today I could show you what I've been doing uh, because Herman the Worm needs a place to live and that's where he's living. But unfortunately, it's way too wet. It's been raining all night and I love the rain. I hope you do as well. But it means that this isn't the best day for doing that. So let me pray with you, and then I'll say a little bit about Eric Johnson and Christian psychology. So let's pray. Father, we thank you that your mercies are new every morning. We wake up and we see that you have created a world, whether it's uh, the sun is shining bright or it's overcast today. You are the God who is in control. And I pray for each person who's listening to me that they would know both the power of your uh, upholding ability as God, but they would also know the personal care that comes from being a God who knows each one of us. Um, whether uh, they're struggling with sickness or maybe just feeling housebound, or whether they have a lot of joy in spending time with family, whatever it is, uh, and in whatever circumstance they find themselves, Lord, be with them, be their God, protect them from sin and evil, protect them from the desires of their own heart, and glorify Christ in them, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to talk a little bit this morning about this book. It's called God and Soul Care, and it's by Eric L. Johnson. And I'll just put that up here. Oh, my, my light is too bright for you to see that. But trust me, it says God and Soul Care by Eric L. Johnson. I've been reading through this book, and I want to share a passage or two uh, with you from chapter 8, which is about sin and psychopathology. Psychopathology just means something that is wrong with the way that we process information. He has a number of principles in this book, and his approach generally is one that I didn't take when I was new in ministry. When I was a relatively young pastor, my perception of Christian counseling is that you would uh, find out the particular moral sin of the person who was involved. So maybe they're uh, full of fear, or maybe they're having a hard time uh, in their marriage. What you have to do is figure out what particular sin they're struggling with, show them from the Word of God that that sin is wrong, tell them that they're supposed to change, and then expect that to happen. And certainly there are times when that's exactly the right approach. But I tried that a number of times. I think it, I remember specifically with marriage uh, difficulties and realized that sin is much deeper and its effect is wider than simply moral, personal moral responsibility. Um, it affects the way we interact with others. Uh, it certainly has an effect on us. We not only affect other people, but the way that they have treated us uh, has affected us, the way that we think about our world and ourselves. And then there is the effect of sin more globally. In other words, sometimes people are born and something is not quite um, the same as it is with other people. Maybe it's something we can see uh, physically. Maybe it's something mentally, uh, mentally or psychologically that's, that's different and makes the processing information difficult. And then you have the whole effect of just living in this world. Uh, some of us, some of you who are listening to me, are struggling with very obvious physical things. Maybe it's cancer. Maybe it's heart disease. Maybe it's a liver problem. Others of you are struggling with things that are more uh, difficult for us to see. Maybe it's worry or doubt or fear. 
Um, they are things that are less per, uh, less easy to perceive when we're interacting with each other, at least initially, and yet they're very, very real, and I don't want to discount that. And in this chapter on sin and Christian, psychopath, uh, Christian understanding of psychopathology, um, Eric Johnson says, in order for us to really appreciate how difficult uh, it is to live in a world full of sin, we need to think about the personal and moral effect of sin, but we also have to think about the way that sin has affected us, other people's sins have affected us, and then thirdly, how the global effect of sin has affected us per particularly in regard to psychology. So I want to talk about that first one this morning, um, sin and our personal moral responsibility, and then move to the other two um, ways that sin has affected us in a couple of weeks. So I want to read... <clears throat> Um, apart from the beginning of this chapter and then skip toward the end. So you have some idea of the way that Eric Johnson approaches this. He says, to summarize our considerations thus far in the book, he says, God is good and made us good in order to share in the Trinity's glory, agency, and communion, loving him supremely and each other as ourselves, joyfully and gratefully. The telos, or that is the end of our design, is to be like God's Son, realized through a developmental journey made possible by God's Spirit. And all of us who are biblical Christians say, amen, that's exactly, right? Our Westminster Shorter Catechism says, what is the chief end of man? It is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And in different language, that's what Eric Johnson says. Now there is a problem, however. He says that goal was rendered immeasurably more difficult than it might have been by human sin, suffering, and biopsychological damage. Each of these problems constitutes a major obstacle to the realization of God's doxological agenda through our participation. He says there are those three aspects of sin, and it makes the end that God has created us for very difficult. Sin is a mysterious dynamic within that predisposes us to oppose God and subvert his glory. Suffering creates an inner conflict between our created desire for self-preservation and our calling to glorify God. And physical and psychological damage compromises human functioning and so can affect our ability to glorify him. Humans, therefore, have three serious impediments to the ends for which they were created, and therefore three interrelated conditions of human psychopathology. That is, three, those three things, our own personal moral sin, our suffering, that is the way other, sins have, uh, other people's sins have affected us, and then the global effect of sin, all of these are things that Christian psychology seeks to address. As a result, in spite of God's goodness and ours derived from his, there is a profoundly tragic dimension to human life. What might have been a pleasant holiday journey into adulthood with God, that is, in a perfect temporal creation, instead has become an epic drama of ultimate, ultimate significance and for some more than others, an arduous and agonizing journey. Friend, I want to bring that to your attention this morning because I think it is easy for us to default into the mode of thinking that what people struggle with is simply their fault. Um, I'll confess to you as a pastor, uh, again, I entered into pastoral ministry thinking that, that the, the solution to every problem was to just point out the personal or responsibility of the person who was coming to me. And again, that didn't work. And I want to say that to you for a variety of reasons. One is to say, if you're at home and you're struggling with some particular difficulty, maybe you're depressed, I want to tell you, I understand that's not something that is just imaginary. Or maybe you're struggling with a great deal of fear or anxiety. Again, I'd say to you, that's not just imaginary. Those things are real. I also want to affirm to you that those things can be a result of sin. That is not your own personal or moral responsibility. They can be but they also can be um, part of the effect of sin around you. In other words, you may have grown up in a home where anxiety was ordinary, or maybe you had a parent who was often very um, depressed, or maybe you grew up in a home where people said things that were incredibly unkind and created new a climate of fear. Uh, all those factor into the way that you're feeling. And I acknowledge that, and the Bible acknowledges that. So to tell you simply, well, you're wrong, don't be fearful, don't be anxious, is to ignore the effect of sin, other people's sin, that has impacted you. Further, it's helpful to acknowledge that the global effect of sin means that some of us will uh, struggle with those effects more than others. Um, I had a man who lived across the hallway from me in college. His name was Hank. 
Uh, Hank woke up every morning, just the most delightful man. He sang on the way to the showers. There were showers in the middle of the halls, the way the dorm was designed. He sang. It was like every morning was the greatest morning ever. I'll tell you, friends, that's not the way I, <laughs> I woke up in college. I was tired. I didn't sleep well. And so I uh, woke up, you might say, a little grumpy. So what does that mean? It means that different people have different dispositions um, by virtue of the way that their mind processes information, the way that they think about life in general. Um, some of that is just a product of who we are in our creation. And some of that is the effect of the way that our minds work differently. Perhaps they have been distorted in some way. And I want to acknowledge that as well. And the reason I want to acknowledge that, and I want you to know the Bible acknowledges that, is because Christ is the one who came to give us an accurate understanding of what is wrong with us. The, the um, modern Western version of what is wrong with us is that it's only what is perceivable. That is, only what we understand. And what the Bible says is that what is wrong with us is what has separated us from God. That is, our problem is that sin has caused a fracture between us and God. And to ignore various aspects of that sin not only is not a reflection of reality, but it also cuts, off, cuts us off from the way in which Christ is able to work in healing us and restoring us, whether that's in our personal moral responsibility for sin, forgiving us, the way that he covers our shame when we have been harmed with, uh, by other people, and the way that he uses other, maybe it's psychologists, maybe it's other doctors, to assist us when we're suffering from the global effect of sin. So all of that is to say, you know, I'm learning and growing during this time, and I hope that you are as well. I really appreciate this book that Eric Johnson has written, and hopefully next week we can come back to more uh, different aspect of sin. I'll talk about suffering next time. So let me pray with you, especially those of you who are suffering in some way, and then we'll go to Herman the Worm. Father, I pray especially today for those who are suffering in some way. Maybe it is remembering something very tragic that has happened to them. Maybe it is a suffering caused by an illness. Maybe it is a mental health issue. Lord, we are glad that you have promised to be with us and to care for us, to bring healing and restoration either in this life or we know finally in the end you will make all things right. Lord, give us the hope and the joy of that truth today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, first, something about worms in general. Uh, my wife is a science teacher at Epic, and she loves science. And because she loves it so much, I've learned to really enjoy it as well. One of the things she taught her class is that worms, most worms are not native to North America. In fact, it's a belief they were brought over from Europe at some point to, in order to cultivate the soil. Now, the reason I say that is because you rarely think about worms as an invasive species. And yet most of the worms you see crawling around in your garden, your typical night crawler, are in fact invasive species. Now that makes them, should we call them immigrants to North America? Sort of like all of us are, unless we happen to be Native American and our forefathers uh, were born here. Otherwise, the rest of us are all immigrants to this land. And so there is something very similar between Herman and me, or Herman and all of us. That is, we've come here and are enjoying the dirt of this world, of this particular part of the world, in a way that that's not really where our forefathers started. I just thought that was an interesting little tidbit. You can check that out. I'm sure a quick Google search will tell you all about the invasive nature of worms. That doesn't mean, however, that worms are bad or that worms aren't helpful, they are very helpful. Um, and in some ways, they have changed the ecosystem in which we live. But I still love worms, and I hope you love worms as well. But now a little story about Herman the worm. And I have to set this story up by saying, I usually talk about Herman as though he were very young, a child. Well, that's true. But you know that, that worms, just like people, grow up. And so this story is about when Herman was a bit older. You might call him a late, late teenager uh, in human terms. And this is the story of Herman the worm and not being able to make his way through the dirt very well. As Herman grew up, something happened to Herman that happened to all young men as they grew up. But also something, did you know, happens to worms? They thought, if you look really close, you can see I shaved this morning. You know why I shaved? Because when I shave, I remove my whiskers. 
Because otherwise, at least for me, I think they don't look very good. I don't grow a very full beard, so I shave my whiskers. But Herman, when he got a little bit older, he started to grow a beard. And not only a little beard, but it got bigger and bigger and bigger. Now his dad said, now Herman, you're welcome to have a beard, but if you do, just know when you try to crawl through the soil, when you try to dig through it, all that dirt will get stuck in your beard. Well, you think Herman listened to his dad? He didn't listen. He thought his beard looked very good. In fact, he grew out a hipster beard, one of these really big, big beards that goes longer and longer and longer. And Herman was such a hipster, if you know what a hipster is, you can ask your parents, that he shaved his head and grew this massive beard. Guess what happened? When Herman woke up in the morning, and he thought, I am hungry, my tummy is so empty, I need to go up to the top of the dirt and find some good leaves to eat. So he would crawl up, crawl up, crawl up, and the dirt kept getting stuck in his beard, and he would go slower and slower because he was so hard to crawl to the surface with his massive beard. And by the time he made it all the way to the top, you know what? All the other worms were in there, eating all the good leaves and all the other good stuff on the dirt. And Herman had nothing left. Oh, poor Herman. Well, do you know what the moral of that story is? Do you know why it's so important that Herman should have shaved his beard? Now, if you're a human being and you don't shave your beard, a young man or an older man, oh, that's perfectly fine. But you understand why it was so bad? For Herman not to shave his beard? Because the burly beard got the worm in the end. <laughs> That's my moral to the story this morning. The burly beard got the worm and he couldn't eat. <laughs> All right, I hope you enjoy that as much as I did telling it. And it is true, I made that one up if you couldn't tell already. <laughs>